Hi Ashish, can you hear me? Just one. Yes, me. All right, thanks. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering if uh, we'll have more people joining us today. Do you have any idea? All right. Okay, okay. People are coming. I think the three, four of us. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think I'll just wait for another minute to see if there's anyone else joining. Then start. Um, so I hope everyone's had a good time learning in this course over the past 12 weeks. This is the last, I think, the last class, yeah, and then you have your exams. So a uh, few of you had mentioned a few concepts that you would like to cover. Um, so I put them in the MCQs and we can discuss further as well. All right, I think we can start. Mm. Hi. Okay. So, all right. So here uh, in the graph alongside, uh, rather there are two graphs alongside. Uh, could you please uh, all tell me uh, what are the two types of growth curves shown out here? So the first one and the second one. Exponential growth curve. Okay. Which is the exponential growth curve? First one. Right. And what is the second one? Uh, logistic gro growth curve. Okay. All right. So I think uh, that's sorted. That you know that one is the logistic growth curve and one is the uh, exponential growth curve. Yes. Sigmoidal growth curve is also known as the logistical growth curve. So could you tell me, uh, could you comment on what is the per capita growth rate in the two figures? So there are two equations that are there in this. One second. Uh, why is it not coming? Right. So population growth rate is described by dn by dt, and uh, this is described for population size for the um, exponential growth curve is given by growth rate into n. That's population size. And then for the sigmoidal growth curve, it is given as r into k minus n divided by k into n, right? These are the two equations describing growth rate. So uh, could you comment on the per capita growth rate in the two figures? One is exponential and one is logistic. What is the difference between the two? And per capita growth rate uh, should be greater in the exponential growth rate than right. the logistic growth right. because uh, the availability of resources is more and the body size of the uh, organisms are, is less which uh, um, this way right yes yes that is uh, absolutely correct and also the per, the per capita growth rate in the exponential population in the exponential growth cycle does it remain the same or does it remain constant or does it decrease compared to yeah remain same Right, correct. So it remains the same. Whereas what happens in the logistic growth curve? What happens to the per capita growth rate? In this curve, what happens? So out here it remains the same. What happens out here? Any guesses? No, it does not remain same. No. 
Yeah. Does it increase or does it decrease? You're right. It doesn't remain the same. But what's happening? The point of reflection is there. So uh, the rate becomes more. Yes. Right. But overall, it becomes, it approaches a maximum, right? And then it drops. So it gets smaller and smaller as the population size increases, right? And this is because of one particular reason. So that is known as a limiting factor. And what is this limiting factor in the second graph? Uh, carrying capacity. Right, correct. So, what is the carrying capacity? I am sure all of you know what the carrying capacity is. Where dn by dt is equal to 0, I think. Uh, yes, but what is the carrying capacity? Not in terms of the equation. Yes, it's the maximum capacity or resources available in an environment that can sustain a given population, right? So that is known as the carrying capacity. And the carrying capacity is dependent on, it differs from organism to organism, right? So the carrying capacity for an elephant would not be the carrying capacity for uh, any other organism, right? Because uh, the amount of resources that an elephant uses is different from the amount of resources, uh, I don't know, some fish uses, right? So the carrying capacity differs from organism to organism. So could you give me an example of uh, Anything that follows a, a J-shaped curve and an S-shaped curve, an exponential and a logistic growth curve. Anything. So let's say what follows a exponential growth curve. Classic examples. Microbes, bacteria. Yeah. So exactly. So that's that's right. So microbes and bacteria because. Uh, they have infinite sources of resources, so they follow an exponential growth curve, right? And what about an S-shaped growth curve? Basically, the large size body organism like us, uh, human beings and other mammals. Okay, that's right. Yeah. So, yeah, I think we can move to the next question. Uh, Ma'am, I have a doubt. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, this uh, we discussed the carrying capacity. Is it a we uh, see it as a cumulative for a particular habitat, or it is a, uh, described for a individual organism? Like uh, the carrying capacity of that particular organism is that, or we discuss it as a whole it's, for a particular habitat? No, it's not for a habitat. So as I said right now, the carrying capacity will uh, change from species to species. Right. So as you can see out here, it's written population size. So population is a group of, what is a population? Yes, one group of organisms belonging to the same species. Correct. Right. So carrying capacity differs from species to species. Even within the same habitat, the carrying capacity for, uh, like, as I mentioned, uh, an elephant would be different from a lion or a tiger, would be different from a deer or sambar, different from some bird species. So, uh, like, in a given particular environment, it can probably sustain one elephant, but 20 deer, right? So, it is species specific. Okay, ma'am. Okay. So, next question. Uh, so, even malaria is malaria that affects birds. It's a density dependent factor to population growth of birds because 
it spreads less quickly in dense populations it spreads by contact it results in more predation it spreads more quickly in dense populations what is the correct answer Okay, one guess for D. D. Okay. Right. So the correct answer, as you have all guessed, it is D. It is a density dependent factor because it spreads more quickly in dense populations. Right. So, more the number of individuals, higher is the uh, transmission rate of this particular disease. Okay, uh, next question. So, the lotka Volterra model looks at how prey and predator numbers oscillate with each other, how prey are always present in an inner, oops, uh, prey are always present in, uh, I've forgotten to add, greater number than the predator. Uh, prey numbers are dependent on predator numbers or predator numbers are dependent on prey numbers. So, choose the correct options. Is it 1 and 2? Is it 2 and 3? Is it 1, 2 and 3? Or is it 1, 3 and 4? I think I should just, uh, okay, D. So the second one is prey are always present in greater number than the predator. Okay, D, another option for D. Okay. Anyone else? How many do we have? Okay, we don't have many people today also, but. All right, so yes, the correct answer is D. And uh, someone had asked earlier as well regarding this. So I have a slide on this. Uh, would someone like to explain what is shown out here? So you have lynx, which is this species of felid and this rabbit this is i think it's a snow horseshoe hare right right on. yeah so does anyone want to take a go at explaining what this graph is actually showing so you have data that has been collected from almost for 75 years from 1850 to 1925, right? And then you have the hare population and then you have the lynx population. So what is the prey and what is the predator out here? What is the predator in this graph? What eats the other? Is the rabbit eating the lynx or the lynx is eating the rabbit? This is not hard, is it? Lynx is eating the rabbit. Yeah. So you have lynx the, is predator. Right. Correct. So you have the lynx in the red and the hare in the blue. And what you can see out here is an oscillation between the predator and prey cycles. Right. So you start off with these many number of hair and these many number of predators. So what's actually happening here? Could someone explain? Yeah. 
the cycle? Um, it is visible that during the eighteen during the year eighteen sixty, as the population of predator increases, the along with this the population of the lynx population is also increases. Sorry, as the population of prey species increases, along with this the uh, population of the predator species also gets increases right. simultaneously. Yeah. But is it happening totally together or a little bit out of sync? Ma'am, one thing is, uh, did you say, did you say well, that there is always a higher number of prey? prey. Uh, not really, right? There are, there are points where there are, there, that, is, that is actually incorrect. If you see like out here, if you take this timestamp point, there is large number of predator, but low number of prey. Right. If you take this peak also, there is very low number of prey. If you take this peak, there is very low number of prey. Right. But in an overall trend pattern, yes. If you are comparing only maximums, the number of maximum prey is more than the number of maximum predator, but not at a particular given point. This is overall. So, uh, okay, so can you tell me why this is happening? Why is there more number of, how can the maxima for the prey be more than the maxima for the predator? Why is that? Not visible on screen. Uh, is my screen not visible? It's visible. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. So there are two things that I've asked here. So the first question is, are the predator and prey cycles in sync with each other? Let's answer that. Yes or no? No. Right. That's very... Sorry? Uh, how I... How to... Sorry, Ashish. I can't. Uh, can't be answered from my side. Oh, okay. um, sure. Yeah. So basically, I'm asking if they are all in sync. So that means if the prey increases, is the predator also increasing exactly in the same fashion, right? But no. The answer is, you first have a surge in prey, and then you have a surge in predator, right? So they are out of phase. Uh, questions in the exams, okay. I think this has already been discussed in one of the initial classes and uh, I think it is only MCQs. But uh, if you like, maybe you can again post this on the, the discussion forum to get an answer. Right, so what is happening out here is that they are not in phase. So the predator numbers in the red does not exactly follow the prey that are increasing in numbers, right? Okay, I think someone came only to ask if the questions are going to be an MCQ or not. All right, so basically what is this stating? This is stating that one of them is tracking the other, right? So when you have an increase in number of prey, suddenly with the increase in number of predator, the number of prey will fall. And you can see that the red graph is little bit skewed towards the right as compared to the lines that are tracking the prey in blue, right? And out here, if you take like any uh, incident time block point, you can see that the number of prey are always much higher in number as compared to predators that are higher in number at any maxima. Why is this? Why is this the possibility? How is this possible? Why is that happening? Uh, 
and the hint is it's a biology related factor why are predator numbers not increasing okay no that is that is true that is true okay so what are the limiting factors here competition competition between predator feed limited amount of prey in the environment okay yes that is uh, competition between predator but there are so many prey right there are so many prey so even if they all like eat the prey they it should just be crashing but yes uh, what bharat kumar says that there is a limit on the number of resources that a predator can prey upon but also if you look at generation times right so in the lynx population they might have only two to three uh, progeny in a year and they reproduce at a much slower rate than the hare right the hare can have about like 7 to 8 or i'm not really sure the number but it's definitely more than the number of lynx right so you find that the hare numbers can really shoot up to a really large population size because their generation time is small so the gestation period for hare is much small it's a couple of months as compared to the lynx which is longer right so that's why like for elephants you have only one calf in a number of years but if you look at mice for example they have a number of progeny every year right and multiple times in a year they can reproduce right so is is that clear and we can also say that as we go higher in the uh, animal hierarchy uh, low number of progeny per year higher in the animal hierarchy which is you mean like in a food chain manner or in terms of biomass Uh, yes you are correct i would not uh, say that is wrong so larger bodied animals take a longer time to reproduce that is yes surely all right so this is basically the predator prey cycle which defines the lotka water equation right okay so we can move on to the next Okay so prior to the industrial revolution light colored pepper moths were abundant but post the revolution dark colored pepper moths were abundant right so this is this case study is an example of stabilization selection disruptive selection directional selection or no selection directional selection okay any other answers no one uh ma'am i think direction only right okay uh bharat kumar says it's a disruptive selection okay okay so everybody agrees that there is selection happening right Jyotsna says disruptive selection. Okay, Ashish also says disruptive selection. Okay, so what is happening out here? Here you have one population that is abundant at first. I don't think I have pen here. Let me try. Um. Okay. 
So here you have, okay, let's just say this is time. And then you have here white colored moths. But then over time, you see that the black colored moths are getting selected, right? So this is, I'm saying white and black. So this is a classic example of direct of directional selection, right? There are some factors. Everybody knows this example, right? So what was the example, what was happening actually here biologically during the industrial revolution? Does anyone remember? Industrial melanism map. Right, correct. So before the white colored moths were uh, able to camouflage themselves and the black colored moths were very visible so they got predated upon more but after the industrial revolution and everything was covered with a uh, black suit the uh, darker colored moths were more camouflaged and the whiter colored moths were more noticeable and hence their population declined right so this is directional selection when this is moving to this disruptive selection is when you have something like this right when the selection pressure acts in the center and you will have both kinds of morphs that are equally present but it's selecting against the intermediate morph type so this is not happening in this case what's happening in this case is it is shifting from white to black right is that clear Yes, yes ma'am. All right. Uh, so, moving on. Okay. So, off the mainland coast of India, there are two islands, A and B, right? Given that A is closer to India than B, A would have fewer species than B, a higher rate of immigration than B, a lower rate of immigration than B, or a lower extinction rate than B. Only with the given information out here, what is the most appropriate answer? So you have two islands near India or a mainland. A would have fewer species or higher rate of immigration or lower rate of immigration or lower extinction rate. What is the most appropriate answer out here? B. Higher rate of immigration. immigration. Then B. Okay. Um, what about the others? What do you think? Do you all agree with Amul? Okay, Ashish says B. B also, ma'am. B. Okay, okay. Okay, so that's great that all of you have uh, understood this. So, yes, definitely A would have a higher rate of immigration than B because it is closer, right? So, the distance that needs to be covered by any migrating species is lesser and thus the number of species that migrate is higher. So this is the theory of island biogeography, right? Where you have number of species on the x-axis and the rate on the y-axis, right? And then you have also two other factors. One is the colonization versus extinction rate, which is basically uh, larger islands have lower extinction rates than smaller islands. And then you have uh, the sizes, right? You have small islands versus large islands. And then you have close islands versus remote islands. This is far, close and far. So if you have an example of a mainland and if you have a species number, if they are equidistant from the mainland, larger the island, more the number of species, smaller the island, less the number of species. Why is that?
Ma'am, could you please repeat the question? So, if you have two island types at the same distance from a mainland, why are there a larger number of species in the bigger island and a lesser number of species on a smaller island? So, number of species increases with island area. Why is this? Uh, food resources, ma'am. Right. So, food resources, just uh, general territory sizes, just uh, there is like a higher number of like the carrying capacity will increase with the size increasing right they are uh, able to because of larger amount of suitability in habitat they are able to support more number of species right and this is the same as the question earlier if you have like two islands if they are nearer they will be having more species than the further one because it will take a lot of time and very few species will be able to migrate to islands that are far. And the species that are more able to migrate to far away islands are what kind of species? If I, if I just take reptiles, amphibians, mammals, birds, Birds, ma'am. Birds, right? Because they have a higher dispersal rate and then they can fly also. Of course, yes, there are animals that can also swim, but how long and how far can they swim to? You might have a lot of mammals on this island, but on this island, you might have very few mammals, right? You might also have a lot of insects on these islands that are able to colonize like any of these islands because they can be dispersed by wind also. Right. So, yes, yeah, so that is the uh, island biogeography theory, which is a very important theory. So, which of the following is not an example of primary succession? New vegetation post a nuclear explosion, explosion in an area, vegetation colonizing old lava fields on a volcanic island, grassland growing on a site of a previous rainforest. Or moss growing on mountain cliffs. Okay, see. B. C. Okay. C, C, C. Okay. Yes, so the right answer is C because uh, there was a previous rainforest in the site. So, a grassland growing on the site is not primary succession because the area was not barren to start with, right? So, yes, C is the correct answer. Okay. So, the marine pyramid of biomass is generally bell-shaped, upright, rectangular or inverted. Inverted, ma'am. Okay, inverted. D, okay. Okay, everyone seems to be agreeing to D. And why is that so? Uh, Ma'am, uh, phytoplankton have less biomass, although they are more in number, and uh, sharks have larger biomass, although they are smaller in number. Right, yeah. So, what about the pyramid of numbers? How is that going to be? It is upright. Right. Upright, ma'am. Right. So, what is the type of parasitism that doesn't involve consuming the host? Is it ectoparasitism? Is it brood parasitism? Is it endoparasitism? Or is it parasitoidism? B, ma'am. B. B. Brood parasitism. Okay. Any other answers? B, okay. 
Okay. So, uh, what is, uh, what are all these kind of parasitism? Ectoparasitism is when the parasite is found outside the host's body, attached to the host body. Uh, endoparasitism is when the parasite is inside the host and a parasitoid form is when the larval stage of the parasite spends its time inside the body of the host. And brood parasitism is when an animal or this is usually seen in birds when they lay eggs in the nests of other birds. They don't create their own nests but they parasitize the nests of a particular species usually they are very uh, specific to the host that they are going to parasite uh, parasitize so like the most common example in india is uh, the asian coil that parasitizes uh, house crow nests okay so which of the following is incorrect for ex situ conservation uh, parasitoidism. Okay, so for parasitoidism, you have a um, uh, lot of like wasp species that uh, they lay their eggs inside, uh, they can be inside like worms also. So, in fact, they lay their larvae inside caterpillar and the caterpillars are completely eaten from inside and when the wasp larvae emerge from the caterpillar, they undergo the larvae cycle and they become wasps. So, yeah. Uh, okay, so what was yeah, so which of the following is incorrect for ex situ conservation? So species are conserved outside their natural habitat. Conservation choice, it is a conservation choice and species are under severe threat. It involves a heavy uh, interaction of human beings in the system and it ensures the sustainability of the environment and the ecosystem. So which of the following statements is incorrect for ex situ conservation. Okay, one guess for D. D, okay, C, okay. So we have D and C. Anyone else? Okay, Bharat Kumar says D. Yes, so actually D is the correct answer. And tell me why is this, uh, why is that statement not true for ex situ conservation? Uh, Ma'am, because uh, sustainability of environment and ecosystem is best preserved in in situ conservation. Correct, right. So out here in ex situ conservation, you are taking the animal out of its natural environment. So you are not ensuring the sustainability of the environment and the ecosystem, right? But if you're doing in situ kind of conservation, you're taking an area and you're protecting the area so that the species within the area can proliferate. So that is what you see in... Uh, Ma'am, but uh, if the species are under severe threat, uh, then it is a better option now it is if we conserve it in the ex situ conservation so Actually, it is better for it helps in sustainability the species population right so, so in an, yeah, in, you're correct mm -hmm. in an ideal situation yes i mean we would all love to protect the environment but it's very hard like especially like when there are certain animals that are under threat of poaching and extinction it is uh, easier to conserve the animal out of its uh, natural habitat in a protected, completely enclosed environment. 
rather than protecting an entire area because if anyone wants to get into that zone they can and also when you need to protect an area for a large animal it it needs it can't be a small area right it has to be a huge area that can support the well-being of the animal but in certain cases when the animals are under severe threat this is not at all possible or feasible so they have to take the animal out of the environment and keep it under controlled monitoring conditions so they are under like constant monitoring in ex situ conservation types right so i think all of you have heard of the great indian bustard which is a large uh, bird that is found in india yes no yes ma'am right so yes ma'am right so the great indian bustard uh, they have of course declared a lot of areas as protected for the gib but still there are problems because these birds i think just recently i think just a day or two before uh, another great indian bustard was fo- uh, found dead because it crashed into one of the electricity transmission lines right so uh, even if you protect an area for a uh, uh, critically like a endangered species like the bustard it is very difficult so that's why you need to have ex situ conservation for animals like this and the great indian bustard they have a captive breeding program which is a form of ex situ conservation where they have been able to successfully hatch several gibs and then hopefully these will be reintroduced into the wild but otherwise if these animals were left alone in the wild they uh, it is unlikely that they would be able to reproduce or sustain themselves in such numbers because of the threats that are being uh, that they are facing right uh, does that does that make sense arithik yes ma'am it's understandable all right Yes, Ranul, you wanted to mention something? No, ma'am, no. Okay. Okay. So, uh, the impact of humans on the environment is driven by a uh, several different factors or a few factors. So, which is the most correct option out here? Is it driven by the population size? Is it driven by population and technology? Is it driven by population and GDP? Or is it driven by population, GDP, and technology? Uh, population and technology ma'am okay so, population okay one for only population one for population and technology another one for population and technology uh, i think okay bharat kumar and amol say it is d population gdp and technology chotsna says d okay lot of different answers yeah i think everyone is probably answered also uh yeah so it's actually all the three factors right so it depends on population affluence is nothing but the gdp which shows the economic status and the other one is technology right so technology because more the amount of technological advancements that we are going the higher is the impact on the ecosystem right and affl- affluence is nothing but the higher the amount of uh, economy that a particular country has or a particular kind of lifestyle generates that critically affects our environment right and these are all in like small small incremental steps so for example just choosing to buy uh, groceries by going outside to a vendor who is selling like groceries that coll- that are collected from the farm versus having the option to sit at home and click a few buttons and do online shopping to get your groceries right how does that affect the environment can anyone tell me uh, more carbon emissions more plastic production for packaging right exactly right so between you going to a, a grocery vendor on the road side it's just you walking or perhaps like traveling by vehicle 
you're getting hopefully you're using reusable cloth bags and not plastic bags but that is your footprint for buying groceries but if you're ordering online that goes to a database that database will sort out things then all your as ranul mentioned all that uh, um whatever groceries you have ordered will be individually packed and 90% of the time it's packed in plastic packaging so you cut down on a lot of plastic packaging and a lot of transportation and a lot of like human labor human labor charges that are also involved if you are just going out and buying groceries yourself yes it is a matter of convenience one more thing is ma'am carbon emission just just like he said because there is the server and there is the there is transfer so that yes yes that is absolutely correct so you see that the cycle is like so long yes you get your items on time and you get them really fast but just because you can do it in some way uh it it ends up having a negative impact on the environment Yes, of course, large chains are now trying to minimize it, uh, their footprint. But it's really difficult, right? So if they need to uh, package like things fresh, it needs to be in plastic. If it's in paper bags, it will get smashed. So a lot of different factors go into it. But yes, as the affluence increases in society, that plays a very important role in. how that affects our environment overall negatively and i'm glad all of you have understood that okay so the maximum sustainable yield is the minimum amount of catch that you can take from a fishery the maximum level at which a natural resource can be routinely exploited without long term depletion the amount of fish that can be caught in the shortest amount of time or the point fishery management's used to determine quotas quotas of how much fish can be taken from the environment okay one answer for b b Okay. Okay. Cool. So everyone agrees on B. Uh, yeah. So it is the maximum level at which a resource can be routinely exploited without long-term generation. Right. This is one of the recent chapters, and we know that if we are uh, um, exploit more resources, uh. that crosses this particular minimum threshold level what will happen is that this population of resource will not be able to recover right so you will have like a huge sudden crash in the population of the resource that has been exploiting that is being exploited and you will never be able to get that resource again because it is not being given enough population size to bounce back in number right so this is one way in which uh, resources uh, due to anthropogenic effects can decline but what are the other factors this is not related to the maximum sustainable yield but yeah yeah ran uh, ma'am i think the method of catching fish is also uh, matters okay uh would you like to explain that uh, ma'am like there are some methods like uh, bottom trawling uh, right. so um, that is an unsustainable method yes of course a uh, method of fishing definitely does matter because some uh, of the methods do include a lot of bycatch and uh, the bycatch is something that is not of perhaps economic purpose but uh ends up disrupting the ecosystem right uh, but uh, that uh, actually covers in this routinely method which says that uh, limited amount yes yes that is true that is true so i was just asking uh, apart from anthropogenic effects what are the other factors than can that can affect 
the sustainability of any resource present. So these are all anthropogenic factors, right? Yeah, so you can have environmental factors also, right? You can have catastrophes, you can have environmental interventions that can result in uh, populations not being able to um, regenerate themselves at a level which is happening as normally in nature, right? So there can be a lot of factors. One is anthropogenic and one is environmental. It can never be just one or the other. Like for example, like in India, you can see how the monsoon, uh, fluctuation of monsoon within the country affects the fish that can be caught, right? And because there's like, there can be like seasonal variation, sometimes the monsoons are too late or it's too early, even in terms of just crop, right? You have all your agricultural crop that gets sometimes severely affected by drought or severely affected by rain. So you can have resources that are affected by environmental factors also and not just um, by exploitation of humans. Okay, so okay, so uh, here's a question on mark and recapture. You need to do some calculations. So you are growing a high value crop in your field, but one day you see several rats in one patch. Before this becomes a problem, you want to first estimate the population of rats in the area. You get a pest control technician to capture and uh, who, who captures and applies numbered pink ear tags to 31 rats, which are then released. A week later, the technician returns and traps 36 rats. Of them, nine of them have ear tags. So tell me, uh, what is the estimate of the total population of rats in this area? One twenty four. Okay, one answer for one twenty four. Okay, don't know. Okay, that's fine. Okay, 124. Right. So, uh, for those who answered, what is the equation that you used? What is it called? What is this method for estimating populations called? I think I mentioned it also as the slide came on. Any ideas? And this is a mark <laughs> capture technique. Right. It's simple okay. arithmetic. Yeah, but I'm asking for the formula. Yeah, so it's a mark and recapture technique. So basically what you have is you have an equation, right? You have the number of uh, marked uh, individuals caught in the first instance and marked divided by the total population which is equal to the number of uh, individuals that are trapped with your tags divided by uh, the marked population in the second sampling divided by the total number of individuals sampled at the second time, right? So you have an equation like this. So you have animals initially marked and released divided by the estimated population size which is equal to the marked individuals caught in the second instance divided by the total individuals caught in the second instance. So if you put this on that side, you get uh, 31, which is the initial number of animals marked and released, multiplied by the total individuals caught in the second instance, which is 36, divided by 
the marked individuals got in the second instance, which is 9, which gives you the answer of 124. So this is known as a mark and recapture model of population estimation. So when does the mark and recapture model fail? Yeah. Yeah. When does it when does it fail? What could be a possible instance when it fails? Mark will be disappear. Yes. Yeah. So when you have your mark that can disappear or that can wash away or that can fall off, like out here for the year tags, you can be estimating the population inaccurately. Right. So, yeah. Okay. So here you have three types of survivorship curves, type one, type two and type three. Uh, and then you have age on the x-axis and uh, number of survivors on a log scale on the y-axis. So humans follow which type of survivorship curve? Any idea? Type 2. Type 2, okay. Uh, any other guesses? Okay, one for type 1, one for type 2. Type 2 again, okay. Type 3, okay. Any other, uh, what about the others? Okay, so uh, what are humans? Humans are type 1 actually. So only Bharat Kumar has gotten the right answer. Why are humans number type 1 uh, uh, follow the type 1 pattern? Because we have a very high number, we have a very high natality rate and low mortality rate. Right. So because of like advancement in like medicine and everything right now, like you have a huge number of uh, humans that are born and they survive till a very long time also. Right. But after they reach a particular age, let's say for now, it's like 80 to 90 years. There are very few people that are surviving right after 80 to 90 years. Of course, like, yes, the age limit is increasing, but there is a drop. Right. So overall, the number of survivors at any age category from young to averagely old is high. Right. So humans follow the type one, the type one type of survivorship curve. What about type two survivorship curves? Who follows type two survivorship curves? Any guesses for type 2? So the most common thing, any other organisms usually follow type 2 survivorship curves, right? Because they can be like any incidences, any uh, uh, factors that can affect their survivorship at any point of time, right? So if you take like birds or like, uh, I don't know, rodents or anything, they have a type 2 survivorship curve. But when you look at the type 3 survivorship curve, this is best represented in plants, right? Where you have a huge number of seeds that are generated by any fruit or any 
flowering crop but only very few of them make it till maturity right so you can probably even see this example when you are growing anything in your house from seeds you sow about like a hundred seeds but out of it only about 20 of them will sprout and uh, out of those 20 not even all the 20 will reach maturity only two of them will reach maturity right so plants are a good example of type 3 survivorship curve okay i have one last question uh, so the phenomenon for using a predator for controlling a pest is known as artificial control biological control confusion technique or genetic engineering Okay, right. Okay, any other answers? Okay, cool. So, yes, it is a method of using biological control when you have a predator that is introduced in a population to control any pest. Yep. So, that was the last question for today. And uh, for this, in fact, entire session. So, um, all the best for your exams, for all those who are taking up the exams. And uh, please upload answers of all online lectures presentations. Yeah, so all the answers are in the uh, YouTube videos, right? Because based on our discussion and all the YouTube videos are uploaded on YouTube. So there is a sheet. I, I think everyone has been already tracking the sheet. Uh, I can just like put in a link. Will the video lectures? Yes, it will stay on the portal and we are not taking it down. So it's going to be there. So this is the sheet with what are the total number of questions that are asked in the examination? That's a great question. I have no idea because uh, yeah, I think if you can just ask NPTEL regarding this because we don't set the questions. Yes, you can download the videos. Mm -hmm. They're going to be there available. Um, maybe just uh, Rithik, you can just post it on the discussion forum if you want. But I'm sure it won't be so long that you don't have enough time to answer it. So but it's all MCQs, no? As far as when I asked uh, the course conductor, uh, Professor Avadhyaya, he did mention there were MCQs. But uh, if you do still have some confusion, maybe just pop it on the discussion forum again. Yeah. Okay, ma'am. All right, then. Thank you all for joining uh, the last... Uh, session for this NPTEL course on wildlife ecology and I hope you have enjoyed your learning during this period and uh, all the best for the exams. So yes, thanks again. Bye. Bye everyone.